On the outbreak of the First World War, many of the Empire's 8 million Czechs and 3 million Slovaks found themselves fighting under the Austrian flag. Compare that to the 100,000 Czech and Slovak exiles living in Russia. On August 5, 1914, the Russian High Command authorized the formation of a battalion recruited from Czechs and Slovaks in Russia. From its start, Thomas Masaryk, the future first president of Czechoslovakia, wanted to develop the Legion from a battalion to a formidable fighting force. To do so, however, he realized that he would need to recruit Czech and Slovak prisoners of war in Russian camps. In late 1914, Russian military authorities permitted the Legion to enlist Czech and Slovak POWs from the Austro-Hungarian army. That order was rescinded after a few weeks. Under these conditions, the Czechoslovak armed unit in Russia grew slowly from 1914 to 1917. The Legion would challenge the authority of Russia's new communist regime, take control of the Trans-Siberian Railroad thousands of miles long, and come within mere hours of rescuing the Tsar and the royal family from murder at the hands of the Bolsheviks. The first notable action by what was then called the Druzhina, the Czech troops conducted a fighting retreat from Galicia in the spring and summer of 1915, together with other formations of the Russian army. The detachment was then sent to the southwest front to fight in the Third Army, where it was divided into independent companies and platoons that were attached to various corps and divisions. Most of these soldiers were bilingual and used their language abilities to convince fellow Czechs and Slovaks in the Austro-Hungarian army to defect to the Allied side. The Austro-Hungarian army lost 324,000 men in Galicia, including 130,000 as prisoners, roughly one-third of the entire army. Russian victories over Austria-Hungary early in the war soon yielded a pool of prisoners. Fresh recruits swelled the ranks, and by April 1916, the Drushina had become the 2,500-man strong Czechoslovak rifle brigade. In the spring, this fledgling force took part in the infamous Bruce Love Offensive. This massive operation was Russia's greatest feat of the war, but cost them over half a million men. Launched in western Ukraine on June 4, 1916, Russian and Czechoslovak forces attacked several weak points in the Austro-Hungarian line, causing it to break. The 1,732,000 strong force smashed through the broken lines and pushed the Central Powers back to defensive positions. The Czechoslovaks became famous for their fighting spirit and discipline during the attack. The Czechoslovak Legion continued fighting alongside the Russian army after the February Revolution, which saw the fall of Tsar Nicholas II and the emergence of the Provisional Government. Russian soldiers, many of whom were swayed by the Bolshevik rhetoric, were becoming increasingly unreliable. On the evening of April 3, 1917, a train from Finland arrived in St. Petersburg and changed history. Aboard was Vladimir Lenin previously exiled to Switzerland by the Tsarist government, but now returned to Russia by a very cynical German high command. Placed in St. Petersburg in the hope that he would topple the provisional government and take Russia out of the war. Order number one was issued March 1st, 1917, and was the first official decree of the Petrograd Soviet. This tremendously weakened the power of officers, giving an overriding mandate to soldier committees. Officers were no longer to be addressed as Your Excellency, but rather as Sir. Uh, Russian War Minister Alexander Kerensky, despite the events in February and March 1917, promised the Entente that Russia could still fulfill its promises for a summer offensive. As the reliability of many Russian military formations was in doubt, only units that volunteered to attack were used in the offensive. Among those who did was the Czechoslovak Rifleman Brigade, also known as the Czechoslovak Legion. The brigade, about 3,530 men, was low on equipment and training, on the other hand, overall morale amongst the members of the brigade was very high. The brigade was commanded by Russian Colonel Vyacheslav Troyanov, but the tactical assault plan was prepared by Czechoslovak officers. Professor Thomas Masaryk, the main organizer of the Czechoslovak resistance against Austria-Hungary, was in telegraphic connection with Colonel Troyanov so he could follow the situation from St. Petersburg for the Kerensky Offensive. The brigade was deployed near Zborov, a town in modern-day Ukraine, in a sector of secondary importance. The 4th Division protected it from the north and the 6th Division from the south. At 5.15 on July 2nd, the second day of the offensive, after an initial artillery bombardment, small groups of legionnaires equipped with grenades attacked the enemy. At 8 o'clock, Colonel Mamontov called Lieutenant Stanislav Sesik by phone to start the attack. 
after shock troops breached the barbed wire defenses, follow-up units took over to continue the attack. By 3 o'clock, the Legion had advanced deep into enemy territory, breaking through the entire Austrian trench line. 3,300 enemy soldiers and 62 officers were captured, while 20 guns and large amounts of war material were seized. Legion losses for the day were just 167 killed and around 900 wounded. This success had no wider effect on the doomed offensive. The battle, however, gave propaganda and political capital to the leaders of the Czechoslovak resistance and convinced the Russian government to end its limitations on new units formed from Czech and Slovak soldiers captured during the war. Moreover, news of the armed action of the Czech exterior resistance reached the Czech people in Austria, Hungary for the first time. Any reference to Czech volunteers fighting on the side of the Entente was viciously suppressed. Despite the victory at Zebrov, the Kerensky offensive was a failure. Kerensky's offensive was meant to boost the morale of the troops and reignite support for Russia's participation in the war. It ended up having the opposite effect. Troops and workers became frustrated with Russia's continued involvement, which led to the July Day's revolt. The provisional government blamed the Bolsheviks for the violence brought about by the revolt, and in a subsequent crackdown, the party was dispersed, with many of the leadership arrested. Immediately following the July days, Alexander Kerensky became prime minister of the provisional government and swiftly appointed General Lav Kornilov the commander-in-chief of the Russian army. In what became known as the Kornilov Affair, General Lav Kornilov, who had been commander-in-chief since July 18th, possibly with Kerensky's agreement, directed an army under Alexander Krimov to march toward Petrograd to restore order. While there have been multiple conflicting opinions on the specifics of how this event had come to be, as well as how it was carried out, one common fact was that to restore peace in Petrograd, Kornilov had been organizing a force of soldiers to move into Petrograd and eliminate the Soviets. In Petrograd, the Soviet, most notably the Bolsheviks, for reasons that were important later on, were given ammunition and arms in the event that Kornilov's troops should arrive at Petrograd and combat be necessary. Traveling by way of Finland, John Reed, an American communist slash journalist, arrived in the capital city of Petrograd immediately after the failed coup of monarchist General Kornilov. He had just pawned his late father's watch and sold his Cape Cod cottage to the birth control activist and sex educator Margaret Sanger. He wrote the following in his book. The last month of the Kerensky regime was marked first by the falling off of the bread supply from two pounds a day to one pound, to half a pound, to a quarter of a pound, and the final week, no bread at all. Holdups in crime increased to such an extent that you could hardly walk down the streets. The papers were full of it. Not only had the government broken down, but the municipal government had absolutely broken down. The city militia was quite disorganized and up in the air and the street cleaning apparatus and all that sort of thing had broken down, milk and everything of that sort. A mood for radical change was in the air. The Bolsheviks, seeking an all-socialist government and immediate end to Russian participation in the war, sought the transfer of power from Kerensky to a Congress of Soviets, a gathering of elected workers and soldiers' deputies to be convened in October. The Kerensky government considered this a kind of coup and moved to shut down the Bolshevik press. It issued warrants of arrest for the Soviet leaders and prepared to transfer the troops of the Petrograd garrison, believed to be unreliable, back to the front. Shortly thereafter, the government announced the immediate closure of not only Raboshiput but also the left-wing Soldat, as well as the far-right newspapers Zivo Slovo and Novaya Rus. In response, at 9 a.m. on October 24, 1917, the Bolshevik Military Revolutionary Committee issued a statement denouncing the government's action. At 10 a.m., Bolshevik aligned soldiers successfully retook the Rabochi printing house. Kerensky responded at approximately 3 p.m. by ordering the raising of all but one of Petrograd's bridges, a tactic used by the government several months earlier during the July Day's revolt. What followed was a series of sporadic clashes over control of the bridges between Red Guard militias aligned with the Military Revolutionary Committee and military units still loyal to the government. At approximately 5 p.m., the Military Revolutionary Committee seized the central telegraph of Petrograd, giving the Bolsheviks control over communications through the city. Kerensky and the provisional government were virtually helpless to offer significant resistance. Railways and railway stations had been controlled by Soviet workers and soldiers for days, making rail travel to and from Petrograd impossible for provisional government officials. 
On the morning of the insurrection, Kerensky desperately searched for a means of reaching military forces he hoped would be friendly to the provisional government outside the city, and ultimately borrowed a Renault car from the American embassy, which he drove from the Winter Palace along with a Pierce Arrow. Kerensky was able to evade the pickets going up around the palace and to drive to meet approaching soldiers. As Kerensky left Petrograd, Lenin wrote a proclamation to the citizens of Russia, stating that the provisional government had been overthrown by the Military Revolutionary Committee. The proclamation was sent by telegraph throughout Russia even as the pro-Soviet soldiers were seizing important control centers throughout the city. The Bolsheviks delayed the assault on the Winter Palace because they could not find functioning artillery. After sporadic gunfire throughout the building, the cabinet of the provisional government surrendered and were imprisoned in Peter and Paul Fortress. The only member who was not arrested was Kerensky himself who had already left the palace. With the Petrograd Soviet now in control of government, garrison and proletariat, the Second All-Russian Congress held its opening session. At the same time, Trotsky dismissed the opposing Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries from Congress. The transfer of power was not without disagreement. The center and right wings of the socialist revolutionaries, as well as the Mensheviks, believed that Lenin and the Bolsheviks had illegally seized power, and they walked out before the resolution was passed. As they exited, they were taunted by Trotsky, who told them, Go where you belong from now on, into the dustbin of history. The Bolsheviks took power in Russia during the October Revolution and announced that Russia would be withdrawing from the war. Talks with the Central Powers started in brest litovsk on December 3, 1917. On the 17th, a ceasefire went into effect. Peace talks soon followed. The chairman of the Czechoslovak National Council, Thomas Masaryk, who had arrived in Russia earlier that year, began planning for the Legion's departure from Russia and transfer to France so they could continue to fight against the Central Powers. Since most of Russia's main ports were blockaded, Masaryk decided that the Legion should travel from Ukraine to the Pacific port of Vladivostok, where the men would embark on transport vessels that would carry them to Western Europe. After the Soviet government concluded an armistice with the Central Powers, the leadership of the Czech Legion began talks with French President Raymond Poincaré. As a result, the French agreed to consider the Legion a unit of the French army and to finance all necessary expenses for its maintenance. New disciplinary and garrison regulations modeled on the French army were introduced into the Legion, with the addition of artillery batteries and thousands of volunteers from prisoner of war camps flooding in. The newly named Czechoslovak Legion would be 40,000 strong by 1918. The French were now paying the bills, but only because Masaryk was planning to evacuate Czechoslovak forces through the Trans-Siberian Railway to Vladivostok, from where they would be transported to Western Europe to continue the fight. Meanwhile, in brest as negotiations began, the Central Powers presented demands for the territory that they had occupied during the 1914-1916 period, including Poland, Lithuania, and Western Latvia. The Bolsheviks decided not to accept these terms and instead withdrew from the negotiations, eventually resulting in the breakdown of the ceasefire. In February, the Central Powers launched Operation Faust Schlag, or Operation Fist Punch, to force the hand of Moscow, also known as the Eleven Days' War. The armies of the Central Powers had advanced over 150 miles within a week, facing no serious Soviet resistance. German troops were now within 100 miles of Petrograd, forcing the Soviets to transfer the capital to Moscow. The rapid advance was described as a railway war with German soldiers using Russian railways to advance eastward. General Hoffmann wrote in his diary on February 22nd, It is the most comical war I have ever known. We put a handful of infantrymen with machine guns and one gun onto a train and rush them off to the next station. They take it, make prisoners of the Bolsheviks, pick up a few more troops and so on. This proceeding has, at any rate, the charm of novelty. As the German offensive was ongoing, Trotsky returned to Petrograd. Most of the leadership still preferred continuing the war, even though Russia was in no position to do so due to the destruction of its army. On March 8th, German troops reached Bakhmut, an important rail hub, and in doing so threatened the Czech Legion with encirclement. The threat was grave because all captured legionnaires were summarily executed as traitors of Austria-Hungary. The 6th and 7th Rifle Regiments, together with the assault battalion of the Czechoslovak Legion, set up defenses at the town against incoming German 91st and 224th Infantry Divisions. The battle was notable because the troops were not only fighting for Bakhmut Railway Junction, but also for the bridge over the Desna River which led to bloody battles at Dutch. 
The climax of the fighting occurred on March 10. This sparked the revolt of the legions. In response, local Bolsheviks intervened, arrested some legion troops. The legion then attacked the Bolsheviks, storming the railway station, freeing their men, and effectively taking over the city of Chelyabinsk while cutting the Bolshevik rail link to Siberia. News of the resulting incident reached the Soviet Commissar for War, Leon Trotsky, who demanded the Legion be completely disarmed and arrested. At an army congress that convened in Chelyabinsk a few days later, the Czechoslovaks, against the wishes of the National Council, refused to disarm and began issuing ultimatums for their passage to Vladivostok. Legionnaires captured the key cities along the railway, including Vladivostok, to prevent the Bolsheviks from halting their trains. It was unintended, but the near total capture of the Trans-Siberian Railway by what was now a hostile army had serious knock-on effects for the Russian Civil War. The Legion had decisively pushed the Bolsheviks from Siberia, making it a haven for white Russian rebels. It also had dire consequences for the Romanovs. On July 17, 1918, Yakov Yurovsky and other Bolshevik jailers, fearing that the Legion would free Nicholas after conquering the town, murdered him and the entire imperial family. After the capture of Yekaterinburg by the Legion and the White Army in July 1918, Radola Gajda set up his headquarters in the city, establishing his office at the Apatiev House, incidentally, where the imprisoned Romanovs had been murdered by the Bolsheviks less than a week prior to the capture of the city. During the summer of 1918, the Czechoslovak National Council made significant headway in its campaign to gain recognition from Allied governments. Shortly after they entered into hostilities against the Bolsheviks, the Legionnaires began making common cause with anti-Bolshevik Russians, who began forming their own governments behind Czechoslovak lines. In the autumn, the Red Army counterattacked, defeating the Whites in Western Siberia. In October, Czechoslovakia was proclaimed newly independent. In November, Austria-Hungary collapsed and World War I ended, intensifying the desire of Legion members to exit Russia. In the summer of 1918, after a bitter fight with the white forces, Trotsky and the Bolsheviks took the town of Kazan. But when the Red Army soldiers triumphantly marched up the steps of the Kazan bank, they found the vaults empty. The treasure was already on its way to Siberia, which was not yet under the control of the revolutionary regime. Trotsky assembled his own train and gave chase. Months later, halfway across Siberia, the treasure train arrived into the hands of General Alexander Kolchak. With Trotsky's troops now on his tail, Kolchak directed the train further east, as far away from the enemy as possible. Before World War I, Russia possessed the third largest gold reserve in the world, vested only by the United States and France. When the war broke out, the Tsar moved nearly 500 tons of gold from the capital of St. Petersburg to Kazakh. Meanwhile, Kolchak's trains, which included the gold bullion captured from Kazan, were stranded along the railway near Nizhnyudinsk after his bodyguards deserted him there. The legionnaires were ordered by Allied representatives in Siberia to safely escort the Admiral to Vladivostok. This plan was resisted by insurgents along the Czechoslovak's route, and as a result the legionnaires, after consulting their commanders, made the controversial decision to turn Kolchak over to the political center, a leftist government formed by socialist revolutionaries in the town of Irkutsk. On February 7, 1920, the Legionnaires had signed an armistice with the 5th Red Army at Kutin, whereby the latter allowed the Czechoslovaks unmolested passage to Vladivostok. In exchange, the Legionnaires agreed not to rescue Admiral Kolchak and to leave the remaining gold bullion with the authorities in Irkutsk. That same day, Kolchak was executed by a Cheka firing squad to prevent his rescue by a small white army then on the outskirts of the city. His body was dumped under the ice of the frozen Angora River and never recovered. When the White Army learned about the execution, its remaining leadership decided to withdraw farther east. The Great Siberian Ice March followed. On March 1, 1920, the last Czechoslovak train passed through that city. The total number of people evacuated with the Czechoslovak Legion was 67,739, including 56,455 soldiers, 3,004 officers, 6,714 civilians, 1716 wives, 717 children, 1935 foreigners, and 190 others. After their return to Czechoslovakia, many formed the core of the new Czechoslovak army.